You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we have a really special guest. We have RJ Hoover on, who just cracked a win on the New River on the, the Hobie BOS series. Dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Good morning. A Michigan guy, you're from up north. H- how did you get involved really in the kayak scene? Because when you think of big water lakes and clear, the first thing that comes to mind is I am not going to want to take a kayak out in the damn ocean. Yeah, totally. I know it, it is, it's a funny place to learn because half the days it's too windy to get out there in a kayak and the other half of the days uh, you're getting killed with boat traffic. So it's really tough to get a good day out there. But I, I think, you know, um, you know, I'm 30. And when I was in college, uh, I started to pond fish a lot. I I grew up my whole life fishing, Um, just, you know, but really more like worms and bobbers, artificial. I never really targeted just bass specifically. And I started pond fishing, catching a lot of bass. I'm like, this is really fun. So the natural next progression was for a lot of people is a kayak. So I bought, you know, kind of your $250 sit-in kayak and really was enjoying that. And then actually my mom sent me a link from like our local kayak dealer. She's like, Hey, there's a kayak bass tournament on Lake St. Clair. You know that I'm like, Hey, that, that kind of sounds cool. Hmm. So I, so I entered that tournament and uh, you know, Lake St. Clair, obviously no one for smallmouth. I had never really fished for smallmouth. So I'm like, I'll just, just hit, you know, beat the banks, fish for largemouth. And I actually capped a check in that tournament on largemouth on St. Clair. Um, and I was just hooked since then. So, um, and then from there kind of progressed to bigger kayaks, not, not, I'm in, I'm in the Hobie PA 14 and, uh, I was just bit by, by the tournament bug and I just kind of always wanted to compete, um, at the highest level I, I, I could. So then I kind of went to, you know, went from that, that tournament that I fished the local circuits had a lot of success there. And I said, well, why not, why, why not throw my hat in the ring on the national stage? So. Yeah, there's not many guys from you know Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin that are that, that are down there doing it. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of long drives, but uh, I, I just am addicted to it. So it, it's interesting, and MLF really highlighted this um, in this past tournament. And there's been a couple of events. The largemouth bass fishery up there is really, I think, underrated, overlooked. I mean, which one? Yes. Uh, well, I, I'd say it's. It's, it's overlooked because, um, you know, the, the elites were just on St. Clair. I, I didn't follow it too closely, but I don't think anyone on camera was catching largemouth consistently. Um, so they're, they're not, you know, big, you know, biggest five fish tournament winning fish up there. But it, it, that's why it's overlooked, because if you're just the average guy that wants to go out and catch fish, there are so many two to four pound bass on, on, our, on our lakes up here um, that, are, that are known for smallmouth. Um, and for me, I, I use that as a way, you know, we're talking about being from Michigan, competing all over the country. It's such a good place to get bites. If you want to go le- learn, learn a technique, I tell people like, go on in St. Clair, you know, fish the canals, fish the docks, like whether it's, you know, you want to get better at spinner bait or, uh, you know, anything you want to, Texas or anything, you're going to get bites, you're going to get reactions from fish. Um, so you can really kind of get good at a technique quickly. Uh, we're just a number of large mouth we have up here. Cause yeah. Cause you look at like, I think it's, I'm going to butcher this name guys. You'll kill me in the comment section. I think it's like signal Bay, um, where major league fishing yes. went. And then that was a lot of large mouth caught. St. Lawrence has more large mouth caught. And, and the one thing I see is like there's vegetation and yes. you see this on, on the elite series, on the boating side of things, guys up North, they're not too scared of going to Florida in the sense that they understand that grass. Was that a strength that you took with you when you started to fish more of the bigger national kayak tour? Totally. Yeah. I mean, one of the first things, again, going back to the pond fishing, I learned how to fish was just like a wacky rig and a, and a Texas rig. And that, that's something like that catches fish everywhere. And and we have a lot of grass up here. And to your point, and that is Saginaw Bay. But yes, uh, that's that, that place is chucked full of fish, like, you know, brown ones, and green ones. Um, again, a lot like Lake St. Clair, but I mean, that's just something where, yeah, I, I was kind of, I, I didn't like, not like the punching, um, you know, frogging kind of grass, but just kind of like that, you know, submergent, you know, you know, tall grass coming out, which is, it's on almost every single lake you'll go to anywhere has some grass like that. There's always bass that, that live in the grass. And, uh, I, it was just, a, it was a comfort thing fishing like that four to six foot foot grass that we have here that again, seemingly everywhere. 
Th this year for you, uh, when we talked a little bit off camera, you only were able to fish a handful of events. And, and so mm -hmm. because of that, I, I do think every tournament, there's a story before the story and it, cause it's decisions and execution that really make or break a, a winner, especially when I really, when you get into the meat of it with guys that won, because you weren't fishing every single event and that puts you in a certain place in the AOI points, I think that affects maybe how you fish the new. Yes. Is that kind of right? Like, what was your mindset going into this knowing like, all right, I fished what two events before this one. Like what were your mm -hmm. thoughts? Yeah. So going into, you know, taking a step back, going into the season, to, to your point, as we talked about, you know, um, you know, in, in my opinion, the most prestigious kayak tournament, uh, you know, we have in the sport is the Hobie tournament of champions, um, which this year is the top 60. You can qualify by either top three, in one of their events, or finishing, I think, in like the, the top 2025 20, in, in angle of the year standings. And, you know, they also change the rules to from going from three events to four events count for AOI. And I'm fishing four. So I'm like, I can't have a bad tournament or I might, you know, shoot myself in the foot. So, you know, some of the events you're fishing, you've got a 200 boat field. You've really got to bring it. And I've learned throughout the years, if you fish to cash a check, you're not going to cash a check. You have to mm -hmm. go into each event fishing to win. And when you, you know, if you if you lose a fish or your fish just aren't as big as they were in practice, that's what that's the kind of tournament you have to have in, at this level to have it even cash a check. Um, you know, you have to be a potentially winning fish. So that's a that's a lesson I've learned the hard way. So I've learned to be consistent. You have to go in fishing for the biggest fish you can find. Um, and so I've done that in the previous three. I've, I've cashed a check now. And uh, I, I fished four tournaments this year. One was local. But you know, I've cashed a check in every single fishing uh, tournament I've fished this year. Three for three in the Hobie series. And that's been my strategy going in. And it's so hard to crack the top three to actually get a win like this. Um, you know, it wasn't by accident. I was trying to find winning fish. I was not trying to fish to cash a check. And I think that's something I need that really needs to be contextualized because when you ask a high school kid or whatever like you got to fish to win and, and really i think w when i hear that it's it's all or nothing you're gonna lock a big glide bait in your hand if you get five bites mm -hmm. and then you look at a brandon polinick where it's like sometimes he's like i'm just gonna putt like i'm just gonna catch a solid limit and then hunt for a big one and he ends up always being in the top of the aoi so when you say you know you're fishing to win like could, could you kind of explain that a little bit more yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Yeah, I think I totally know what you mean. I am not by any means going out there with a glide bait, yeah. you know, 10 inch baits. I'm I'm trying to figure out. So my, my, my approach to practice is and I don't I don't talk to a lot of people about the fishery. So if you know, going into the new, you know, there's always some, some doc talk and I have I have some close friends that I kind of bounce ideas around kind of say like, are you like not so much like how you're catching them? But like, are we thinking it's going to take, you know, so for, for the new river here, um, you know, is it going to take 90, 95? Is it going to take 80? Well, you know, what is it going to take? So that's the first thing I'm trying to figure out because that's so important. If you're having really good days in the water and catching 80, but it takes 90 to win, you're not even going to be close. So when I'm fishing, to, if I'm trying to figure out how, how to win, I'm trying to figure out how, how do I catch the winning fish? Um, and, you know, kayaks different than a boat tournament. Um, thinking I'm looking for areas that I can grind out for two days with a variety of baits that I'm, that I'm going to be able to catch those winning quality fish, even if that means, you know, moving ramps or moving around, um, whatever the case may be. I'm just like, I tell people that all the time who are like, Hey, like, how do I, how do I, how do I be consistent or, or how do I, I really want to cash a check. I, I you know, I, I want to get the invite back to awards. And like, I tell people like there, there's no magic baits. So get that out of your head. There's no magic baits. There's no, you know, hocus pocus. The only thing you have to do is find those fish and catch those fish. It's literally that simple. So if I'm trying to win, I'm just trying to find the fish that I can catch my ways. That's going to put me up there. I think Gerald Swindle says like, you know, if, if he goes into a tournament and it's doing something he's not comfortable, he's like, I maybe won that that way, but I'm not going to win the tournament that mm -hmm. way. So I have, you know, a, a stable of say, say 10 techniques. That's really all I fish anywhere I go. And you just make slight m modifications and just look for those fish that could could potentially you know put you in the winner's circle. Yeah, because I, I think the consistency thing is so important. I, I remember when Mark Jeffries was still on on BTL, and I think it was uh, racking my brain when Brandon Polinick won on Lake Champlain, and they asked about luck, and and Brandon Polinick, I remember, stopped for a second, thought about, it, and he said like. 
you know, it's not luck to find them. It's luck that when you drop your bait down there, it's the four pounder that grabs it before the two pounder. And I thought that's Dude. so freaking interesting how he put that. Yeah, no, that, 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 that could not be more true. And, you know, I, I think you fish competitively and, you know, if you have friends that don't fish and they're like, they're like, isn't fishing just luck? And I'm like, then I usually say something similar to what, what you say there. It's like, you know, it's not luck. You know, the number of fish you catch is, is skill and the, and the, and the fish you find is also skill. But to, to that point, like, you know, that's kind of my, my approach. It's like, you know, I, I, I found an area that has, you know, 16 to 20 inch fish. You can't necessarily control if the if the twenties aren't biting, you know, before the eighteens or the sixteens. If you're in a school, same thing. But it goes back to I'm I'm really trying to catch. My strategy is is a, is a high volume of bites to get feedback to make necessary changes and kind of continue to process of, of elimination throughout the day to find bigger fish. Another mistake I used to make, I'd be thinking like, you know, first cast or like I'm going to start on my best stuff with my best bait idea. And, you know, CLS goes, and when you don't have success in the morning, you can kind of spun out. You're like, oh, like, I'm not, I'm not on them. I'm not having success. Now I look at the opposite. Like you should get better throughout the day because you're getting more and more feedback from the fish. So if you're not getting bites, you're not getting that feedback, but that's kind of how, you know, at, at, at the new river in the afternoons were one of my best periods because I'm like, I'm a, I'm continually eliminating techniques or areas throughout the day. That I, that I think are working and you can kind of continue to, to narrow down how you're trying to catch those fish. And that really kind of, kind of leads us into like, you know, the, the pre-tournament preview here. Uh, you know, everyone's been to the Susquehanna leading up to this tournament. Everyone's talking about the Susquehanna, Susquehanna, Susquehanna. It's like the Susquehanna mm-hmm. throw chatterbait. Cause it's like the Susquehanna. What were you, what were your thought processes going yeah. into this tournament? I mean, you, you do have friends that do fish this river a little bit. Mm-hmm. I personally thought, you know, and again, like I, I just had a, a, a real Ethan Stone, who who is a big guide on that river with uh, New River Outdoor mm-hmm. Company. You know, he said like all the fish in the Susquehanna are usually cookie cutter sizes. The New River has big ones in it. The Susquehanna, believe it or not, guys, it has never given up a state record. The New River has twice given up a state record. So mm-hmm. there are absolute monsters in this place. And I thought we would at least see one get cracked out of there. Mm-hmm. Did that? What was your thoughts going into it? Yeah, so I wish I had listened to your podcast, <laughs> Ethan, before I went down there. Um, but it kind of goes back to the doc talk thing. Like, you know, I, 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 you know, the easiest way to have a bad tournament is to have preconceived notions that, that, that you can't let go of. That's a great way to, to get your feelings hurt. So I try to go with an open mind because usually what's supposed to be happening isn't happening. But, you know, I fished the Sandusky one time and had a lot of fun. Um, and you know, I just know if you follow the national trails, everyone talks about Susky, 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 the Susquehanna is so good. And it is a great fishery. Um, I've actually fished on the Kanawha river in West Virginia, which is, hmm. I think is what the new river turns into, yeah. uh, as it kind of, and I've caught small enough up there, um, actually fishing for catfish bait, but they were like big 19s and 20s. So I, I've caught big fish in that area before. So I'm like, huh, okay. That they're here. And you know, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be as good as the Susquehanna just because that is really, that's a really high bar. Um, but, you know, coming into it, again, it goes back to what kind of fish am, am I looking for? Um, you know, it turns out that you, you didn't need those those giant 19s and 20s to win. Um, and, you know, in that interview, you know, Ethan's talking about how there are those giant dinosaur state record fish in there. Although they weren't caught in the tournament, I know that that, that I think I think a couple twenty twos were caught in practice, yeah. and then Hobie showed the picture. There was a twenty three and a quarter <sighs> caught in practice. So I mean, that's all you need to know. Those fish live in there, and also too, I I, I did know, and we'll talk about the areas fishing in a little bit, I'm sure. But I, I did know that maybe the quote unquote best areas of the new were not inbound. So that naturally kind of has to temper your expectations. You know, if you take any fishery and take away certain parts of it, you know, you're eliminating the potential, you know, to have a great event. Not that this wasn't a good event and we have to have boundaries, but I wasn't going to pout about that. I know some locals were kind of like, oh, why aren't those in bounds? I mean, I would have loved to fish those areas, too. Um, but I but that just kind of kind of narrowed down the areas I wanted to try to fish even to begin with. 
It's interesting because this is a classic example. The, the Susquehanna River for the kayak guys, I really feel like is like the St. Lawrence River for the big boat guys, where the first time they went there, yeah. it's unknown. It's going to suck. We don't know anything about it. And now it's like the old FLW Beaver Lake where we're going to go there six times a year. <laughs> and there's so much data on it to where you can really fine tune a pattern. And the new this time around, no one besides the locals had no preconceived notions of, of how to deal with that. And I think that's fascinating because the Susky and the new are completely different creatures. And, and hell, I say Absolutely. the new is dan- more dangerous just from a navigation standpoint. Because I remember talking Fair. to Jeff Little um, at, at ICAST a little bit. He's like, yeah, I'm going to go down there just in case somebody needs help. <laughs> and so, and he was serious about that. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, if people think smallmouth and river you know, oh, the, the same thing. Yeah, to your to your point, they are they are completely different. And so, I mean, the water color is different, the water depth is different. Um, you know, the, the 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 fish are different, and the main thing that makes them different was just how. So, the Susquehanna, very wide river. Mm-hmm. Um, so the water is never really that that deep. You don't get you know you you get some areas that might be a little sketchy, but um, the new has areas where you will die if you go off those falls. Yeah. So yeah, you've you really had to be careful navigating which did play into my strategy. Um, but you know, to me, it, it didn't, it didn't affect too much of how I was fishing, but I, I, I think it did kind of take some areas and made them maybe a little bit difficult for people to access. Um, but you know, overall, I think it, it, it was a great fishery and, and I, and I hope we go back. And it's interesting, like, like what you said, like it, it's the Susquehanna is really shallow and wide. Whereas the new, I think the majority of the portion that you guys fish was, be- was below clear Lake dam. And I know yep. with the upper James where you have the Jackson river that is, is fed by Lake Moomaw, that means the water temperature is consistently a little bit cooler, but then it also means there's more current. There's a consistent current mm-hmm. flow and that place absolutely rips, which is, it, mm-hmm. it makes it a lot harder with the, the, the Hobie series specifically where you're not going to have seven trolling motors on your boat to really get into an area. Mm-hmm. You have to anchor, you have to really? think about that. And so, yeah, I mean, I mean, let, let's kind of get it, let's get into it now. Like your, your day one, like you mm-hmm. said uh, earlier on, on another podcast and you know, I'll give them a shout, shout out kayak bass nation, um, that you weren't going to drift, which I appreciate mm-hmm. you saying that as, as a river rat myself, why? Mm-hmm. So coming down there, you know, it, it, it goes back to controlling the variables, right? So to me, I don't care whether it's a lake or whatever the case may be, whether you're looking at, you know, if, if a lake, like a big lake, like St. Clair, you're looking at potentially, you know, wind factoring into what you can fish. You're looking at rain that can potentially, depending on certain areas of fishing. So to me, the biggest factor going into this tournament was um, I, I wanted to control the area I was able to fish. And to me, doing a float, just that I, I don't know why, but I just can't get over the fact like that it, it goes it goes back to getting feedback throughout the day. Um, if I find, say, a great uh, you know set of rocks on a float, right? If I'm doing a six mile float and that's on the first mile, well. I, I can't go back and try those rocks again later in the afternoon. Um, and, and, I, and I know you can try to make changes on, on similar areas, but to me, I really wanted to find the best stuff I could find that I could access and fish all day, as opposed to doing a float and having to drive the trucks around and all that. I just was not interested in, uh, in, in doing that dance. With that said, the, the the new river for for people that you know live more towards DCPA or on the Susquehanna, it's a lot more narrow and deep. It's almost like the Nile River in some places, and it can get 20, 30 feet deep. But when you think of the Susquehanna, you can fish like you said fr- from from you know the left to the right. You have a lot of width in an area. Mm-hmm. The new's not like that at all. And so when you say you're going to fish an area, were you ever worried about how many? Was there enough to get you through each day? Did you ever mm-hmm. have that worry? I. I did, um, and it's also good to know too. For this event, again, it's very unique. I think they do this once a year for those events. You know, we were able to get out and portage our kayaks, um, which also put into my strategy. And but this river was so strong in a lot of areas. I mean, I mean, I like to think I'm in pretty good shape, but it was exhausting. And that's one thing too. Like, I, I just think like physically, if you're especially if you're paddling, you you could not single access this event in, in at least the areas I was fishing. There's just not a, I mean, you would be, if, unless you were like, you know, wading in the water, you could not, your arm could fall off. You know, my, my legs were very tired. Um, but I, I, I just started by, so I had to stretch a river where I would go down river. And I also practiced an area where I, where I'd go up river from the same launch. So I don't know exactly how far it was, maybe a mile and a half. Okay. Um, and you know, it just in practice, I found enough fish in there. I'm like, 
you know, and I caught good, good fish throughout the stretch. I'm like, you know, somewhere in here, I need to be able to catch five fish a day. If, if I can, it's my fault, you know? So I wasn't looking to just have massive amounts of water to cover. I, I, I just feel like I can fish my best when I get to know every little nook and cranny. It, it goes back to, you know, I started practicing on Thursday at Thursday, Friday practice, and then two days on the water, Saturday, Sunday, you know, after four days on a stretch like that, you should know where kind of the, the sweet spot and the sweet spot is. And again, it kind of goes back to getting better every day on the water. When if you're doing a float, it's kind of tough to, to find all those little sweet spots. If you're covering six miles in four days, it's just, that's just too much water in my opinion, at least for me to, to really break down. Yeah, it, it really is. And then again, you're dealing with a kayak. You're not dealing with a 250 or a jet boat on there to where you can really move between spots. And, and so going into this, going into day one, um, just really, you know, walk us through, cause I, I know, I remember again, guys, a link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, including I'm going to link the, uh, the other podcast episode I listened to with kayak bass nation, mm -hmm. you know, you were really hung up on the chatter bait. And the first thing I heard that is like, ah, that's, I, I just didn't like that earlier in the podcast. Like that's, this place is not going to probably fish like the Susquehanna where you can power fish. This is more like a yeah. Shenandoah river, a Creek, something like that is usually, I feel mm -hmm. how like this place fishes. Yeah. So it goes back to those preconceived notions, yeah. you know, you try to shake them, but I mean, the chatter bait on the Susquehanna is probably the best bait. Um, you know, whether you want to throw a, a small one or big one, you know, that they'll just eat it. Those fish are just for the reason a little bit more aggressive. Um, but so coming in, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, chatter bait catches bigger fish. It goes back to trying to find those more quality fish, but I just wasn't catching any fish on, on the chatter bait. So, um, I figured that out in practice and it can, it, continually finesse my way down to, and again, I'm very, very comfortable with, I, I, I feel like I, I can win an event more likely um, with a bunch of spinning rods than I yeah. can with, uh, it's like a slug fest with just, you know, a bunch of moving baits. So I, I was, I was right, right in my comfort zone and yeah, quickly find out the, these fish don't like, they, they just, they just would not eat the big bait, the spinner bait and all that. Um, and, and I think if you, if you, if you got hung up on that for, for too long, um, you, you, you were missing fish and not getting, not, not getting the feedback that, that you needed for, in, in the form of bites. It, it is interesting. Cause when you look at like the Susquehanna, you know, river and guys, again, I try to do a, a monthly bi-monthly fishing report in the Susky. There's a lot more forage speaking of, of, you know, bait fish, shiners, things like that to where they're chasing it down. Whereas the new river has basically, it's their version of a rusty crayfish, which looks like a damn lobster. It's massive. And so yeah, those things are big. It, it's huge. And so these things are more focused looking downward, almost, I think like on a St. Lawrence where they're looking for gobies, right? You can still get them to chase above their head, but they're usually looking mm -hmm. downward. Mm -hmm. So you get into day one of the tournament. Did you start with that chatterbait? And then how long before you made an audible? Yeah. So, so to get down to my area, I actually had to portage. It's possible if you knew the river well enough, you, you may have been able to get, to get away with it. And I'm in a Hobie, so I've, I've got a pedal drive. I, I can't get through three inches of water. Um, so I had to pull the drive, drag myself across this, this pretty big rock flat, which wasn't bad going down, but coming back up was a little bit more difficult. But so, you know, coming in, I, you know, I could even fish, you know, the, you know, for about 10 minutes to even get down to my area. And, you know, again, I think like I actually started with top water and I don't know that they're going to go back to that. They didn't want anything like that. I, I just, I, you know, I tried whopper plopper, big, small walking bait. Yeah, they, I, I couldn't get any keepers to eat it, hmm. but I was a little hard headed and started with that both days. Never got a blow up on it. And then it goes back to, I, I did try the chatter bait on, on, on day one. As soon as I put that whopper plopper down on kind of like what I thought was like a big fish feeding area. And sure enough, I think the first bite of the tournament, I got absolutely destroyed. I mean, it was the best cheddar bait bite I've ever had in my life. And I fished that a lot. This fish completely slack lined it. And again, I, I, it felt like you just took the cheddar bait and blew it up. And it felt like I broke off because I go to set the hook and the, it, I just whipped. So I'm thinking like, I'm like, is this a musky? Well, I don't know. So I'm really in line. It gets taut again. And I go to, I go to pull up and set the hook. And this, it was like a 19, 20 inch class fish, which I had not seen all week, jumps off. And it goes back to something I've learned, like, again, that to me, although it sucked, I lost that fish and I was upset. I'm like, okay, that's feedback, right? Mm -hmm. This is an area where there are big fish. I don't know that chatterbait is the bait because again, I, that was my first real good bite on it all week. So I think a little bit longer, didn't, didn't get anything else on it. 
And then um, I, I kind of hunkered down in that area and switched to a jerk bait, caught my biggest fish of the day on a jerk bait. I think it's 17 and a quarter. And at the end of that time, I didn't know how good that fish would be, but that was turning out to be a really good fish. I, and, um, and I don't mean to cut you off there, but we talked about like, yeah. po like positive feedback, negative feedback. You smoked a 21 or 20 incher on a chatterbait. Mm -hmm. How long did you keep with the chatterbait after that before you made that switch? Not, not long. Wow. Okay. Uh, no, I, I would say, you know, I, I, I probably locked it in my hand for maybe 15, 20 minutes. That's and impressive. Again, I would have held it a lot no, longer. But again, I, I mean, trust me, I wanted to make it work. But again, I, I already had an idea, like, this is not something you can lock in your hand. Like, again, the Susquehanna, if you lock a chatterbait in your hand, you're probably going to catch a good limit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, really good fish. I don't think you could catch five. I don't, maybe I would have caught five fish all day if I just locked it in my hand. I didn't want to take that risk. Because, again, it just, and and part of the reason why is in my area, um, so they, there's like the dragonfly hatch. I see, you know, like, pretty good fish. To my frustration, uh, jumping out of the water, surfacing, eating things off the top, blowing up on bait. So I'm like, this is a this is, there's there's an active feeding window here, and I'm not getting bites on what I'm throwing. So I need to change. So I, I think I think I had two casting rods with me, and then I the other one had the jerk bait on it. Um, and I, I threw it out there, got got one. I, I did I did stick with that a little bit longer, probably too long in hindsight, because that was the only fish I caught the whole rest of the tournament on that on that jerk bait. But it, it, it was a good one. Yeah, it, it, it's so crazy with, with these, I don't know, like I would call like the Susquehanna or Freaky River, but the normal rivers, it's crazy how the biggest smallmouth will, will, will just dial in on these small patterns. And I, I had uh, Ethan Stone guys on the show who's with the New River Outdoor Company, and he talked about like the biggest fish we catch in the summertime here are on flies usually. And that's the same thing when I have... Oh, uh, I believe that. Yeah. And same thing with Rob England. We talked about the upper James same. And this is kind of where I think Nolan got his thought process of like, of using that, uh, that fly imitator on the Susky. And it's just, it's right. stupid how these fish will either lock into a lobster or a damn larvae, but they get <laughs> yeah. that precise on what they want to eat. Yeah. I, again, I, I didn't have any of those magic little yeah. bug baits. Um, but you know, we'll talk about, you know, I think a key adjustment that I figured out was, um, you know, I, I love to throw Sankos. I mean, those can work everywhere, but something I, I learned in practice was they, they would not eat a five inch Sanko. Um, so I switched to the four and immediately started catching fish. So that was my next trick up my sleeve. I'm like, well, you know, I'll just, I'll just float this wacky rig around. And again, I quickly on day one dropped down to my main area where again, in practice, I just saw dozens i mean i'm not like dozens of keeper fish kind of cruising around and i'm like okay they they're they're in here so i, I went drifted down to that spot and very quickly caught a limit um hmm. and and so i i i think aj said i was the first one to, to to have a limit and um i didn't even submit every fish i caught i was just i think i caught them on three consecutive casts like a 16 and three quarters a 15 and something and a 14 and a quarter and, you know, I was like, holy crap, you know, this is going on. But the current was so strong in that area. Um, I was fortunate because I don't have a power pole. I knew I didn't want to bring an anchor. That was kind of kind of dangerous. So I was able to actually, there was some topped out grass. And I actually was able to push myself into that topped out grass, put my dry, like, can I have, have my fins in it? And I was able to kind of hold, hold the spot there in the grass and just kind of float the wacky rig very naturally. Um down down this uh current seam and they were just stacked in there and just it was it was a it was a ton of fun that's what i'm saying this is this is such a great river it, it bums me out that more people didn't have that kind of experience but it was i was just like oh my gosh this is this is a blast yeah i feel like if they if people came back to this place um i, I think the way to be a little bit better now that that people have a, a database to go off of um yes and the one thing guys there's two things we forgot to mention at first which was again one huge shout out to you know, kayak back nation bass nation for this interview was you had to first cast and launch was at six so mm -hmm. that factors into it and then also always with these tournaments is cell service um yes did that play a factor at all into your strategy of like i gotta get the hell yep. i gotta get to mcdonald's or something yeah. quick <laughs> yeah um i've played that game before and it goes back to controlling what you can control I didn't want to fish in an area that didn't have cell service. Mm. So I was going to fish. And again, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know the different nooks. I, I don't know where there's service and where there's not. I pre-fished a couple of places that did not have service. And I, that, that, that worried me. So I fished in a relatively 
um, populated area because again, I, I wanted to be able to submit fish. Get, again, I don't think too. It's one thing. To, it's also I know some people are like do you do you look at the leaderboard during the day or do you not look at the leaderboard? Uh, the second I, I, I catch five or at least five by noon, I'm looking at the leaderboard because you're doing yourself a disservice not not knowing. And this played this really played into my strategy on day one to know what I needed to do to have the lead. Um, if you don't have service, you just kind of you don't know if you've got 75 if that's good. If you you know have a limit, if that's good. But yeah, I was like, I want to fish somewhere where where, where I have service, where, where I can single access, and you know, again, I can fish fish my strengths. And then you talked about the the Senko, and there was there was another bait that that kind of played into it. Did did you go with the um, the, the the Mega Bass Spark Shed first, and then you switched to the Senko, or did you mm -hmm. Senko first and then the Mega Bass Spark Shed? Yeah. So um, on day two is when I switched that Spark Shed. Gotcha. But I'll say, but you know, and 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 that was just out of the. I wanted something that I could cover a little bit more, more water with, because the way I was fishing the the wacky rig and caught that limit. Um, Again, so I switched. I, I I knew going into day one, do not throw a five inch Sanko. Again, I know it sounds so funny, um, but I think there were there's something to that smaller profile and fishing it very naturally, weightless. Hmm. And I, I I caught some fish on a tube in practice. I did not I did not catch one keeper fish on a Ned rig, and I throw a Ned rig a that lot. That surprises me. That really does surprise. Yeah, me. Yeah, it was it was shocking to me. It was shocking to me. Again, I. I've, I've, I've made a lot of money on a net rig, had a lot of great tournaments, um, even places you don't think it would work, but it wasn't working for me. So I just knew that, that, that four inch Sanka was the ticket. So once I kind of wore out the fish in the wacky rig, I, I switched to that Texas rig with, uh, with a heavier hook, you know, that, um, just a three out hook that kind of gave a little bit of weight. And I was just making really long casts. Another thing too, huge advantage to fishing single access as opposed to a float, you can you can do this on a float, but all day long, I did not make a cast either either day that was going that was not up current mm -hmm. and drifting down. So every single one of my casts, I felt like counted. It where you're not like kind of like making an awkward pitch at a rock floating by. Like I can make perfect casts every single day, and I don't know how many more bites that resulted in, but just because of how finicky they were, um, if you drifted over them, they they, they weren't going to bite. So I just knew to make long casts, drift the bait down, you know, and really milk these areas. Um, and I, I figured out that for whatever reason, that Texas rig was catching those 17 inch fish more so than the wacky rig. And I don't know if that's because, you know, the, the 12 inches would get to the wacky first or what the case may be, but those, those, those bigger fish really like the, really like hmm. that Texas rig. Presentation. That's interesting. And so going into day two, you have the lead, but you're at home, you're, you're at the Airbnb and you have everything going through your head. And yeah. when this goes back to, I think our earlier conversation about, you know, fishing to win, or mm -hmm. you had a big enough lead. And this is kind of like in Florida lakes where usually you'll, you'll have a big bag and it's like, I just need to hold on and catch a limit. And I got this, where were your, th what was your thought process going into day two? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, swing for the so, fence or just get a damn limit and see if you can hold on. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question going in. And I've, and I've had leads before, or, or you know, been top five, top three, and you know, e each time is so is so different. I and you know, I, I had never won won one of these before, so I I was going into it thinking, and then so I had the lead for day one, but the afternoon on day two, again, it goes back to having service, right? I'm checking the leaderboard, and I think for a brief period, I lost the lead because I had kind of make gone off my 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 main area, and I'm like, well. Let me go back because I, I don't, I think I'm like 78 or something like that. So I went out called three times and, and, and had the lead, I think an 81 and three quarters. Um, and I think, you know, Jody Queen, who's, you know, the best kayak fisherman of all time and is on his home body of water there is, is right behind me in second place going into day two. So to answer your, your, your question about, you know, my, my thinking, you know, just catch a limit or, or go big. In my mind, I was like, I'm not going to play it safe because I made that mistake before. Again, it, go, it goes back to now I know what kind of fish it takes to win, which were turns out to be 16 to 17 inch fish. Um, you know, don't don't be stupid. Just fish all day with baits that I thought those those, those 16 and 17s were going to bite. I caught a lot less fish on day two, um, but that was intentional. I, I didn't need to screw around with just trying to catch five anymore. And that was interesting because you, you just mentioned like you left your key area. Why did you do that? 
the the key the key area on day one where I caught my 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 limit going into day two, I didn't think that that was going to be that. I didn't think that there were as many winning fish mm. in that general area. So it goes back to so on day two, again I I've now been on the water for three days and I figured out the 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 biggest bites I was getting were kind of at that first light like around that, that six o'clock time. Because my biggest fish of day one was the first fish. So going into day two, again, I'm hard headed. I, I, I'm like, I, I've got to try this, this chatter bait at least for a short period. And sure enough, on that same general area, I caught a 17 three quarter, which again, was a really nice, nice fish for this tournament. And um, I didn't fish the chatter bait too much longer after that. And kind of hunkered down in this area where I thought there were fewer fish, but they were definitely bigger. And, um, a key adjustment I made was I actually switched on this particular area from a Yamamoto Sanko four inch to a Yumdinger four inch bait. Hmm. And, uh, and I'm, I'm telling you, if, if you have a live scope, you definitely know this to be true. I think the Sanko sinks twice as fast, not exaggerating as a Yumdinger. I can believe that. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it, it's like, it's an incredible difference. That's so important because going for that natural presentation, I'm, I'm, I, I, I was floating it over these rocks and, and, and I, and the Yamamoto kind of get the, the, the Sankos kept getting snagged a lot on day one. And I'm like, I just feel like I wasn't getting an, an effective presentation. So at least for that wacky rig, um, and the Texas rig, I switched to that and like that, that shallower water that kind of went over this little break. And I caught a 16, three quarter and a 17 and a quarter on the Yumdinger instead of the Sanko. Um, and, and I think that, I think that was one of the key things I, I learned, which is kind of using a really light bait. They were feeding up to your point on larva or whatever the case may be, or if they, you know, if they haven't come over the rock, maybe they thought it was a crayfish, but, um, on, on, on day two, I think my first three fish were like, there was like, I think I had two over 17 and a 16 and three quarters. And I felt really confident at that point. So I knew I could just take my time and get two more 17s. And I knew that would probably take me pretty far. And just just to clarify, at what point of the day in this? Because you said first light. So is this like you had these by like eight a.m. Yeah. by like seven? Like what time? Yeah, no, I, I I think I had those three fish within the first hour. Damn, or, or that's close nice. Through that, yeah. So yeah, no, that was that was huge. And again, that that wasn't that main area. I found a practice where you had to like these. It just the area was just beautiful. But I, I I didn't for whatever reason you know the I wasn't catching bigger fish there all day and I, I caught a bunch of keepers a lot of 14s and 15s um but i'm and i was just thinking about i'm like well let me just commit to an area i think i can get bigger fish in the morning because i tried that area on for a while on the afternoon of day one and did not even get a sniff so i'm like they're not here all day there's a window here make the most of it and i and i caught every bite i had on on day two that that, that would have helped me that's that's insane, dude. That really is. And, yeah. and then with these areas, how much did you let them rest, or did you just camp mm -hmm. camp down on them and just cast after cast after cast, or was it catch one, move off, let it settle, and then go back? Were you having to protect the area? Like, what's yes. the strategy there? Yeah. So very 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 fortunate. I didn't have to protect the areas. Again, these fish, at least for me, were very skittish. So if, if you went over them, because the water was getting clear and clear every single day. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the day, I, th I, mean, there, I think there had been some rain that was kind of pushing through the river. But yeah, at least in my area, by the end of day two, I was seeing the bottom of eight feet uh, of water. So, but if, if you drifted over them, I, they, they would not eat. So to answer your question about was I kind of leaving them alone? You know, was I letting the areas rest? Um, I, I just was making sure to not go over their heads. So I would kind of go out of my way to knock it over their heads. And I would, again, making long casts to the same general areas without ever, I feel like I wasn't spooking them. I just think, like, again, they, they, they were so finicky. And I've, I've I, again, I, I don't have a lot of experience in rivers like the new, but I just, I've been in the water my, my, my whole life. And you can just know kind of how fish and you know, how they react to things. You know, you have to make the perfect cast sometimes. And if you, so I just, in my, in my mind, I'm like, if I can keep bombing this the Sanko with strictly a chatterbait up there, come over the rock just right. Um, I didn't think I was spooking the fish, and I just knew that there was enough big ones in that area that they would eventually. I'd make that perfect cast, and the fish had had, had just had no idea I was there.
with, with with the water being that clear and dealing with pressured smallmouth, did liter size make a difference? Did you ever drop down to like you know four, five, six, eight? Like what what was the setup there? Yeah, that that is a great question. I think this is something that so many people overlook. Yeah. Um, I so again with 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 very little exception, you know, um, earlier in the year uh, when we were in Texas, I was fishing a, a, a ten pound test leader. Um, if we're in Michigan, you're dealing with you know twenty five foot visibility. Sometimes the six helps. But I almost exclusively throw eight pound test um, on on my leader. Mm-hmm. So eight pound test, ten pound braid. I'm throwing that on all of my all of my finesse applications. I don't care whether it's a, a half uh, you know a half ounce drop shot or a weightless w- wacky rig. I don't. I, I just don't lose fish on those setups. But I think I think the more important things people don't think about. They, they think a lot about what what pound test am I throwing, which which can make a difference. In this case, I think the, the biggest difference is how long yeah. the leader was. Yeah. So, it, so uh, again, the, the way I think about it, especially with like current like this. So let's just, let's just just for example, if I'm fishing a lake, and I'm fishing and it's and it's and it's four feet deep, right? Um, braid floats, fluorocarbon sinks, and I don't want you know the, the braid down where the fish can see it if it's if it's relatively clear. So maybe like a, you know, um, you know, so maybe you're throwing like a, like a six, if it's calm, you know, it's just the tank is going to drop straight down. So maybe you're throwing like a, like a six foot leader, like the length of the rod works n- normally there. Um, but if I'm fishing deep, deeper water, I definitely want a longer leader. I'm fishing four foot water in current. So I think the problem is if I was throwing like a, you know, say like a eight foot leader or, you know, 10 foot leader, when I'm throwing, when I'm making these long casts, the bait sinking, that fluorocarbon sinking, and it's all getting pulled through the current. And I think it kind of creates like a, a drag, you know, almost like, yeah. like, like, like a slinky. So if you get the bite and you may not, number one, you may not feel the bite because there's just so much crap in the water. But I was noticing even sometimes like in practice, like my line was getting snagged on rocks, not the bait. So I was fishing with a much shorter leader than I normally would throw. Interesting. I was throwing, I was throwing maybe like like a, like a four foot leader, which I I, and I, I don't normally do that. Mm. But the reason was is because I was making those casts, long casts. The braid's floating, right, floating towards me. I'm slowly reeling it in, and that and that fluorocarbon is 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 you know just enough in the water where the bait's on the bottom, but it's not so much that it's sinking as well and getting caught up in the current and the rocks. So that was that was a key thing for me. I think was fishing with a shorter leader in that sh- in that in that narrow water. Um, so just kind of keeping that fluorocarbon out of the water, out of the rocks, keeping the braid floating on on top, and just creating a real natural presentation. I mean, it just sounds like fly fishing one one. It's just like if you're making a drift with, yeah. with a fly, it's crazy. <laughs> and again, I, I don't have a lot of experience fly yeah. fishing, but I, I have I have caught trout doing that, and I, I think that definitely helped. That's kind of I was thinking about it. Making again, if you think about trout, you know. You make the same cast again and again and again and again. Um, sometimes, and that's how I figured this. I'm like, let me just keep making the same cast again and again, really naturally, just just floating it down, and uh, eventually one's going to be in the mood to eat it. When did you think you had it? Did you ever have that feeling, or was it yeah. not until they handed you the trophy? <laughs> yeah, you know they, you know there, there's that there's that old cliche, you know, in fishing, you know, when it's your time, it's 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 your time. And I had never had that feeling. So you, it doesn't make sense until you have it. But when I caught those three big ones, I was like, you know, I was like, I think there's blood in the water here. I need to close this out. Um, and then I think by 10 o'clock, um, I, I, I moved down to, to my to my original uh, best area and caught, you know, say like a 15, another 17. So I think I was sitting at like, you know, my day one limit was 81 and three quarters, which Turned out to be really good. Really, I had, I had the biggest limit on day one, and day two, I think I had like eighty-two, and I'm like, wow, I just caught an even bigger limit. It's only ten o'clock. That's when I thought I was gonna have it, um, and then everything just shut down. Like, like the, the sun got up a little bit, mm-hmm. and it, it really, it really turned off. And I, I didn't feel comfortable at eighty-two, but just again checking the leaderboard, no one else was catching them. So, you know, I, I had a really big lead and I was like, okay, don't, don't spin out. Let's just fish slow. Let's, let's try and cover some new areas with some, you know, let's cover a little bit of new, new water with some new, new techniques, which when I, which when I started using that spark shad, 
and caught two more 17s on on that bait, um, which was just which was just uh, I, at that point I was like I think that was the winning move. That so. that I mean when it's your it's when it's your time it's your time. I mean and, and that's mm-hmm. why with with boat pressure and and again you know this is going to be something that we I think we need to talk about because it's a mm-hmm. good conversation. You know whether you have a bunch of people on your spot or not, if it's meant to be, it, it, it's meant mm-hmm. to be. And then getting into that, like, did you share a lot of water then, or did you have it all to yourself? Yeah. So for the most part, I had it all to myself on day one. Uh, you know, so on day one of the tournament, um, I was a little late getting to my ramp, <laughs> but later than I would have liked to be. And um, yeah, I think there was one or two other guys. <laughs> Yeah. So there, there, yeah, there were, uh, hopefully you're all right. There, there was, yeah, uh, there, there's, there's a lot to the guys there. And historically I've had my best tournaments when there's a lot of boats at the ramp. So I don't necessarily love seeing a few boats there. Cause I'm like, maybe my fish were fluky. I'm only, I'm, you know, uh, but it turned it out that I, I, I'd, I'd found really quality fish on day one and did not have to fish the, the, the area. And, and, and by the way, just for your, for your listeners, um, I was fishing out of narrows, Virginia. So I was fishing in Virginia water in that narrows area. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it, it was, it was a, there were, there was, there was a handful of ramps in that area that people did well out of, but for whatever reason, I was the only one that, that, that found, you know, quality fish out of this ramp day two, I was the only boat fishing out of that ramp. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, that's a really good feeling when you, you know, when, when you've got the lead going into the final day of the event, you know, you're on great fish and you're the only boat at the ramp. I mean, it was very, I was like, I can't imagine a, a better scenario here because I did not stress about anyone, you know, sharing water, working around boats. It was just all me. So, and, and then I, I'm, I'm maybe I, I misheard this on, on the mm-hmm. other podcast that you're on, but there was, there was somebody that showed up and I can, I, I could, yeah. I could have this incorrect. No, you're, you're right. Day one or day two? It was day two? Day two. Day two. Yeah. Mentally. So, hey, how did you process that? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not one to get, get into the drama, but yes, there, there was, I, I did <laughs> on, on day two, um, you know, talking about that, that area, there was a way, which I didn't know there was a way, I, but there was a way apparently to come up river to kind of one of my, one of my areas. And that, that was kind of one of the main areas that I, I, I found and I fished on day one. So I'm fishing my area a little up river hard on day two and i'm thinking you know like i'm not trying to be comp- i don't have to race anybody to that spot right because i'm like there's no one else here well i kind of pound that area i'm like okay let's drop back and catch us two more good ones on my on my main area and just down river there, there's a kayak and i'm like how is that i'm like there's a kayak out here how did i'm like what is <clears throat> is that a competitor so i get down there and someone had come up the falls hmm. uh the nearest falls which, you know, that, that, that was a heroic, I don't know how, I don't know how he did it, yeah. but yeah, that, that, that was impressive. And, you know, I wouldn't say I was spun out, but I was really upset that, you know, you know, I, I didn't know if he, if he knew that area, if he knew I was catching him there, but it, it did spin me out a little bit. But as I was coming down, down river, he saw me and quickly skirted, skirted away. So, um, you know, if I had waited a little bit longer, I think he would have been, you know, pretty close to it's right on the juice. So, I, I felt lucky that I got down there to guard that area when, when I did. Um, but that was a time where, you know, I could have easily really, you know, got upset and spun out. But I kind of just said, you know, you've already got three good ones. You just need two more. You know, I didn't think he hit any of the really good stuff. And, you know, you've got all, you've got all day. Don't, don't, don't let that be an excuse to why you don't get it done. And I think that's so interesting because, again, you know, listening to, to Kayak Bass Nation and a multitude of, of, of other shows, guys from down south, if they see a boat or a kayak six miles away, they throw the rods in the water, say it's over. I can't do this. This is bull. This really is crowded. He's haul shotting. And then where I grew up on the title Potomac, if you're fishing a spring tournament, if you're not fishing like a Madawoman Creek or a Quaya, you're going to catch shit and it's going to be boat mm-hmm. to boat. And you brought up like, well, on St. Clair, it's like, yeah, sometimes this is how it is. That's the culture of it. And it's a hell of a superpower to be like, yeah, there's boats here, but that's, there's fish. I'm going to just deal with it. Yeah. I know again. Yeah. I, I don't mind fishing in a crowd. Uh, I, I really don't. Um, you know, in this instance, it, it did bother me because mm-hmm. I didn't have a crowd on day one. So it did it bother me a little bit, but yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where I feel if there's a lot of boats at the ramp, 
that means there's a lot of fish there. And you know what? And a lot of times, especially on, on, a, on a northern lake, certain times of the year, like you're not going to catch a lot of fish if you're not on that on that honey hole on that one stretch. And it's just like a thing where it's like, hey, we're all going to come out and have a good time and, you know, may the best man win. The, the fish are there. Catch the fish. Um, it's, it's kind of just a, a known thing. But, yeah, in especially on the tournament scene, some people get really thrown off. If there's another boat in their ramp or in their bay or their cove. And I'm like, if, if you know there are fish there, then catch the fish. You know, that's just kind of how you, you know, if you go on, like, with any reason why you won't catch them, I think you can easily get, get spun out. So, um that just it doesn't bother me in this instance it did a little bit but again i'm like there's so many fish in here even even if he caught caught a few i don't need to catch you know you know five good ones i just need two good ones i think i'll be all right and 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 just to to add more to that because this is the gamesmanship that i think is going to be the future because as lakes get more busy as rivers get more busy gamesmanship on how you manage your fish are so important Mm -hmm. i I, if if i was in your situation i think the thing is like there was no other like boat trailer so to speak there when you got there to where Mm -hmm. in your mind it's like i need to run straight to my juice and maybe play a little protection here it was the surprise like where the hell did you come from and then it kind of just starts getting into your brain is that why you feel like you didn't start really down there first it's like no one's gonna be here. Oh yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't think I had to protect anything, yeah. which you know, I would have fished differently. So, and in a way, and upon you know, upon reflecting on it, I you know maybe I don't catch one of those seventeens because I don't really fish that area that slowly because I'm True. like I need to get down river and fish my area. Um, so hmm. you know, it, you know, it, it, it could have worked for me, kind of an you know, unintended consequence. Um, but the, all that you recognize in hindsight, in the moment, you're like, oh my God, you know, my, there's someone, <laughs> there's someone on my, on my, on my fish. Did he, you know, I don't know where, I don't know exactly what areas that, that, that they, he, did, he did get to, but, um, yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, like it goes back to con- controlling what you can control. Yep. You, you can't control where someone else is going to fish for the most part, but you have so much control over, over how you perceive it and, and how you let it affect you. Um, so I just, when something like that happens, I just learn to kind of fish slow, just keep a bait in the water and just kind of, you know, process what's, what's happening and and make the most intelligent decision. RJ, I mean, congratulations on your first win. That is huge. It's bumped you up to, you know, I think you're top 41 in points right now. I think you said you you have one more event, you know, up on the Mississippi river. Mm -hmm. Again, like how does this affect your judgment going into that now that you have a win? Yeah. So (laughs) Yeah, so 40, 41st on on three events is is, is good. Yeah, uh, I was doing the math. If I can, if I can pull out a win, and assuming you know other other people could could jockey around spots too, but you know if everybody get another win, you know I would be in third place in the angle of the year standings, which would be awesome. And I think you know anything top twenty five would would be really high up there. You know, well into the top ten. So. You know, going in, into this event, uh, I'm lacrosse. I've been there a handful of times before. I used to really dislike that place, but really, I've I've I've, I've come to like it. Apparently, I'm hot on rivers, so I'm going to try again. It goes back to like I'm going to try and win the event, and if I you know miss a few fish or stumble, you know I'd like to still think I'm going to be all right. So at least at least at lacrosse, I think everyone's been there a number of times. We kind of know what it takes, so you, you know what you're looking for. But uh, I mean, my, my approach is in, it just goes back to kind of that random pond like train of thought, like, you know, I'm going to try and find high quality fish and make them bite. And if the, the winning fish bite, great. But if the, you know, other good fish in the area bite, then I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be too upset about it. So, Is there anybody that we can help promote any sponsors? Yeah. So I don't, I don't play the sponsorship game. So uh, I am, I am, uh, I don't have sponsors to promote, but um, if, if, if you want to follow me or, or add me as, as a friend on, on Facebook, it's just, just RJ Hoover. So, you know, one, one of the best parts about winning was just, it was just so much fun to have, you know, people that have helped you throughout the years. And, you know, you, you, you know the sport's so cool, kayak fishing, you know, it's super competitive, but in the day there's just, it's, it's, it, there's a real camaraderie there. And I think everyone knows how hard it is to get a win and have, and have good, good tournaments. So it was just so much fun to, to, to hear from people I've heard from in, in a while or just, you know phone calls, the, the, the whole drive back, just talking about the, you know, the event with friends. So um, a big thank you to, to everyone that's, that, that's helped me get to this point. Um, but again, yeah, feel free to add me as a friend and uh, 
we'll see if we can't get, get it done on lacrosse. No, it's a well-deserved win, dude. Again, guys, link in the episode description to everything we talked about, including RJ's social media handles. Give him a follow, and yeah, good luck at good luck at the Mississippi River. And guys, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. We are the number one fishing show in the greater Maryland, Virginia, and PA area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.